open your heart, there's room for everybody. Let's talk about it with film producer Kevin Downs on Steve Brown, etc. He's an old white guy, an author, broadcaster, and seminary professor who's sick of religion. And he's brought friends. Please welcome Steve Brown, etc. Hey, we're so glad we're here. I say it all the time, and I mean it all the time. You always have a place at our table. Uh, You wondered, I'm Steve, the aforementioned old white guy. Matthew Porter is our executive producer. Matthew wants to become successful enough in the movie business that he gets courted by the Scientologist. <laughs> That's a high bar, though. you got to have a lot of good opening weekends. <laughs> Our producer, Jinx, is in the little glass booth. Jinx is such an audio guy that the first time he heard his baby's heartbeat, he asked if he could get a little bit more treble in the mix. <laughs> And our video director in one-man IT department is John Myers. He's in his tech bunker. John helped us watch Kevin's new film online, uh, though it was dubbed in Mandarin Chinese. (laughs) And Dr. George Bingham is the president of Key Life. George believes no time is wasted if it's spent growing a beard. And... (laughs) Kathy Wyatt is, I didn't, I am just read it. I didn't write <laughs> these things. And Kathy Wyatt is the soft feminine side of the program, now back from Maine. And Catherine, I haven't seen any lobster tails. No. You didn't even think about us, did Not you? Not at all. Have you, you seen the price there? of lobster recently? <laughs> oh, I thought it was similar to Veggie Tales. <laughs> no, that's different. Matt, that's right. Matt, yeah. yo, we've got a film producer on. You could have done a little better with uh, the jokes. <laughs> that Scientology thing is time. not going to happen. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Speaking of a film producer, uh, Kevin Downs is a writer and director and producer and actor whose career spans three decades. Early in uh, his career, he produced a critically acclaimed film starring Mira Sorvino, Academy Award winner. And more recently, Kevin partnered with filmmakers uh, John and Andrew Irwin who to form Kingdom Story Company. And Kevin's latest movie just opened in theaters, and it's called The Jesus Revolution. Before we go any further, I must say uh, the guys sent us and allowed us to watch this movie on the film uh, to live stream it in our offices. I, uh, everybody else watched the whole thing and loved it. I watched a quarter of it and turned it off because I was in tears. I mean, I was there. I, I'm an old guy. I remember 50 years ago. I remember when it started. I remember what happened at the local college, the way our church filled up, the criticism, the excitement, the joy, the laughter. And as I watched that thing, and everybody knows real men don't cry, so Kevin, thanks a lot. <laughs> and so I have decided... I've seen enough of this. I've got this day job to do, and I can't sit here like some wuss crying. (laughs) I've got to get to work. So I talked to my wife, and we're going to see it tonight in a dark theater (laughs) where nobody will know that I'm falling apart. (laughs) This movie is so good. This film is incredible. Not just you expect from Kevin that he's going to turn out a good product. I mean, that's what he does, and he's known for doing that. But catching the reality and the spirit and the feel of an actual occurrence, that's not a little thing. Mm -hmm. And, Kevin, you did that. Uh, Man, all kinds of pictures are going through my mind and memories, and your film set those off because you hit the nail on the head. That was it. And uh, at least the first quarter, you maybe <laughs> you, 
You maybe screwed it up the rest of the <laughs> film. Like no, Hamlet, no by he the way. did not. I'll find out tonight. What, <laughs> what started it? How, I, where did you get the idea? I mean, I know most people, you bring up Jesus movement, they don't know what you're talking about. Uh, what happened to you, and how did you get involved in this? Well, my goal really was just to make you cry. That was it. <laughs> so, well, it only took about 25 minutes. <laughs> And the mission was accomplished. So I mean, we could pack it up and go home because uh, real men don't cry except when they watch Jesus Revolution. Oh, that's uh, right. Or Rudy, that, but yes. Or, or Rudy. Yeah, right. <laughs> There's a segue. <laughs> exactly. Oh, my goodness. Uh, you guys are hysterical. Actually, uh, before the segment is over, I definitely want to talk about lobster tails. That sounds really fascinating. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it's, stay on, stay on focus. <laughs> we got forty-five okay. minutes. Yeah. Jesus we don't Revolution. Have forever for this thing. <laughs> I mean, we can make a sequel called Lobster Revolution. Yeah. There you go. Uh, yes, <laughs> that would work. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a gift to be able to make films for an audience and those stories to move people. I mean, that's really the the reason why we make them is um you know we want to be able to uh you know kingdom story company was founded by myself and john and andrew Irwin, and um you know our goal is to tell true life stories that showcase the power of the gospel i mean that's that's really it and if you look at our past films uh going back to woodlawn um mm. which was before i can only imagine uh that's actually where we uncovered this story uh, John found a Time Magazine article with the headline, uh, The Jesus Revolution. And as, as he was looking through it, he's like, man, this would make a great movie one day. But that wasn't the movie we were actually making. <laughs> and so you see snippets of The Jesus Revolution in a lot of the films that we've done from Woodlawn to The Jesus Music. Um, you know, they're just we were just really fascinated by it. And so uh, when we met Greg Laurie and did interviews with him and his wife, Kathy, we realized there was a really significant movie here that needed to be told. and you know, God just had his timing. Uh, we tried several times to get it lifted up and off the ground and into production. And uh, the COVID pandemic kind of shut us down once and didn't realize we would have another shot to make it. But our partners at Lionsgate, after we did a film called American Underdog, said, you know what, we need to make Jesus Revolution. So how can you argue with that? <laughs> so uh, we we were like, yes, let's do that. And um, and they've been great partners and fully supportive of it. And um, just really thrilled. The feedback that we've gotten after the first weekend has just been amazing. You know, one of the things that people don't recognize is how, and you got it, was how powerful that was. I mean, that was not a bunch of religious people singing Kumbaya. It was a, a powerful thing that you in colleges and universities, students would come from where it was happening at their college. They would walk on campus and kids would fall under conviction. God would be involved. Uh, and it and it's we're still living. In fact, almost um, you would be surprised at how many leaders, Christian leaders and pastors and missionaries all over the world uh, came out of that Jesus movement. I mean, it revolutionized uh, yeah. everything. <laughs> yeah, so many of them did. I mean, you know, there's over a thousand Calvary Chapel churches alone. That's right. Um, that came out of that. But also uh, pastors from different denominations. I mean, I know so many of them. That was a reason. That was also another reason why we wanted to do the film because we know so many pastors that got their spiritual birth out of the Jesus movement, mm. and um, and we wanted to be able to share their story with the world, or at least the themes of their story with yeah. the next generation that's coming behind them, and uh, and that was important for us. And so it was exciting, you know, as we're gearing up to release. It takes, you know. From the time uh, Lionsgate said, let's go make it, it took about 14 or 15 months to get the film made. 
And uh, we didn't know that there'd be actual revivals going on. I mean, like, seriously, you can't write this stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's incredible. You know, there may be a God. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, seriously, uh, you know, people, I mean, actually, I haven't heard of anybody wondering if we, we uh, you know, help coordinate, but I can assure you we had absolutely nothing to do with it. <laughs> and um uh, but it's it's incredible that the timing of the release uh, just really coincides uh, with these revivals that are taking place across college campuses, and that was yeah. the that was the hope, that was the prayer, was that um, God would usually would use the film, um, you know, to really bring people closer to Him and really put it out into the atmosphere. Uh, in a way that was beyond anything we could imagine. And he's looking like he's certainly done that. Yeah, so right, it really, it's so cool. Mm -hmm. You, uh, By the way, to go back, you know, it, it, this is not just a Calvary Chapel thing. This right. was across the board. The Crucio movement in Roman Catholicism has its roots in the Jesus movement. And frankly, Kevin, we're running out of gasoline. You know, it was, I would just say, Lord, you know, it's time, man. We're all dying. <laughs> Those of us who were there, we're dying. You know, and it's hard to be a leader if you're dead. So you got to raise up some. So maybe that's what we're seeing in our time. Um, Kevin is the producer of this movie. And I don't want to be manipulative or in any way try to force you to go see it. And, but if you don't, you will get the fever and die. <laughs> Jesus is nice, but you don't want to mess with him. Uh, make sure you go to the theater and see this. And make sure it's dark so if you're a wuss like me and you start crying, your girlfriend won't know. a lot that you would take time out of your day and spend it with us. Uh, we're talking to writer, director, producer, and actor Kevin Downs and his latest film, and I kid about it, but you really need to see it. But don't just see it. Make sure you bring some people with you, especially pagans. Uh, uh, bring friends with you. If they're unbelievers, they'll be impressed with the film because of the skill with which it's produced. and uh, But there's something going on there, and you want to be there to watch what happens to your friends when that happens. Kevin, a lot to say uh, about the film, just in no particular order. Uh, beautifully shot. Um, mm -hmm. In particular, the shots in uh, on the mountainside by the... Uh, by the beach in Southern California, it seemed lo looked like you shot it at 6 p.m. every single time, and it's just a. It made me miss being in Southern California because it's so so pretty. Um, but a lot of attention paid. I mean, it's a period uh, film, you know. So there's a lot of different aspects you've got to all get kind of dialed in and correct. So it's 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 you know set in the late 60s and then before. I wonder if you talk a little bit about that kind of process and 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 the amount of effort and care that went into getting that just right. Yeah, where did you get the old cars? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, uh, 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 the combination. So the film was shot, uh, I would say, about 75% in uh, L.A., which is lower Alabama. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, and, um, and so we... Uh, uh, we shot about 75% of it there, and then we shot about nine days in Orange County, California, because we believe that the um, location of Pirate's Cove is an actual character in the movie, and we just couldn't, we couldn't. You can't you know, shoot, shoot that shoot in that. Vancouver. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't shoot that anywhere else. I mean, just because it's so iconic in its topography, and and um, and so that part of the shoot was very, uh, 
you know, that was risky because you don't know what the weather's going to be like. Uh, you know, we shot it in the first week, the first two weeks of March last year, and it could be rainy and overcast. And if it was, that would ruin the whole thing. <laughs> so uh, thankfully, when we got into it, it wasn't rainy and overcast. We actually had a heat wave. It was about 90 degrees, wow. which was unbelievable. <laughs> and uh, we had blue skies and sunshine and, um, you know, great crew. And uh, we really were able to take advantage of of the uh the landscapes and the uh the weather and all of that to showcase and really give the vibe and the feel of what we wanted the audiences to feel for that time period because you know you have a brief brief moment to tell a story that really expands a long period of time and and so just even little things like the weather being just right was really significant for us hmm. kevin um my my wife and i contributed to the successful opening weekend we actually went to the theater to see it and it, nice. and, it, and it does present just incredibly well on the big screen i mean a lot of people don't get that experience that much anymore yeah. but um and the the portrayals the acting and so forth i mean you had jonathan rumi from the chosen uh you had uh Kelsey Grammer from that great oh. spiritual classic, Frasier. That's right. And, uh, you know, so many great performances. And it's, and it's not, uh, you know, it's not just a kind of a churchy kind of thing. There's some gritty aspects to it. Um, what, how, how far did you feel like you could go with that or were you trying to go? I mean, you had the conflicts with their, um, the ego, um, conflicts, um, some of the drug use scenes and so forth. Um, you were kind of, for what people would call a Christian film, you might consider you were pushing the envelope a little bit. What was some yeah, of your thinking with that? It. Yeah, I mean, look, we pushed it as far as we could push it without getting an R rating uh, from the MPAA. So <laughs> we didn't want to do that, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's we went as far as we were able to go. And um, and even with that, it's I, I thought we, you know, uh, 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 John and Brent McCorkle, the, the co-directors of the film, did a really great job of kind of walking the tightrope so that you're not <laughs> glorifying the drug use when you see it. But you're you're able to see kind of the depravity of man and their fallen nature so that they have somewhere to go. Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of got in and got out. We didn't really keep the audience underwater too long. Uh, and I think that's you see that with the the response of people to the film. That's not what they were focused on. They were focused on the rest of it. Um, you know, one of the highlights for me, at least, uh, in watching some of the the rough edits come back was just a relationship between, um, uh, well, I'll say the actors, Kelsey and Jonathan, but Chuck mm -hmm. Smith and Lonnie Frisbee. Uh, you know, that first twenty minutes to me is is yeah. one of the, at least for all my films is probably the strongest 20 minutes of a film that I've ever done mm. and um you know they really set the table and suck you into mm. what their characters are what their backstory is and what their mission is and what they're trying to accomplish I mean Kelsey you immediately just fall in love with him I mean you mm. see his struggle in his eyes and in his performance you know as Chuck Smith and what he really wants to do without having to get to dialogue heavy you know in the process but yet a lot of, of information is actually coming across and so it's not easy to do that and so i you know i commend um you know our filmmaking team to just really be able to walk that tight rope and get that message across in a way that's really entertaining entertaining i mean i've seen the film and i'm not joking probably five or six hundred times <laughs> um just because in the in the course of post-production you see it over and over and over again <laughs> And uh, and and I never get tired of watching um, that that first half an hour of the movie. It's just so fascinating to me. I think Jonathan Rumi did such, such a great job um, mm, yeah. of really drawing you in. And, and same with Kelsey. I, to, for me, Kelsey said it on on live TV, but I also think it's the best performance of anything he's ever done. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and it's we're so we we were gifted to be able to have him in the film and to have him really be passionate about the film because that you want both of those things when you're making a story like this. And and for them not to feel like they have to say something, but for them to really believe it, and it's it's beautiful to watch. And um, yeah, I'm just really proud of it. I think it, I think the movie is going to have a long life. And one of those things as a filmmaker, your hope is that you can make films that 
will, will really outlast you for a long, long time. And I, I do believe that Jesus Revolution is, is one of those movies. Mm. Kevin, I had read, and you got to tell me if, if this is correct or not, that at some point uh, Jim Gaffigan was considered for the for the Greg Laurie role. Yeah, Jim Gaffigan was considered, um, you know, in a different. It was actually a different version of the script altogether. Mm. It would and have so, to be. Pre-pandemic. I can't see him in there. I mean, he's, yeah, he's no, getting yeah, pre-pan- He has dramatic jobs, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Pre-pandemic, we had a, a slightly different version of this, and. Um, uh, it was just not the same. And so, you know, once the pandemic hit and, and Lionsgate said, let's do it again, we took another hard look at the script and, and we designed it in a way where we felt like it would nurture um, America and nurture our society in a way that we believe we needed. And by the way, in that first part with Chuck Smith, boy, you got that. I felt that. I mean, I knew what he was thinking because I'd been there and done that. Yeah. I wore a yeah. collar and this is going to mess up my church and my career and I'm just not going there. And then okay. when it happened, you had to go there because it was Jesus and you can't ignore that. And he didn't. And it was so cool. Hey guys, like Jesus, we're coming back. And we're uh, talking to writer, director, producer, actor Kevin Down. The movie's in theaters now, and you got to see it. I'm kidding about it uh, a lot, but I'm serious. This is a serious movie, and uh, you got to you got to see. It's called Jesus Revolution. By the way, you can keep up with uh, Kevin's work at KingdomStoryCompany.com and on Twitter at Kevin Downs. Kevin, um, just two things. In the very beginning, one of my fa- one of my favorite scenes in, in the very beginning was the first scene um, in Chuck's church with all like 12 people that were in his congregation at that point. And, um, mm-hmm. and the expression on the faces of uh, a couple of those elderly couples um, was just priceless because I I remember the expressions on faces, um, you know, back in those days and, and seeing that happen. And I loved the point when or, or the that one particular spot where the one elderly gentleman got up and was feeling the pressure to leave along with the other couple and then went and sat down in the middle of all of those kids. And, uh, and I can remember similar situations to that. So I thought it was, I thought it was, it was just very, very poignant. Um, and, and I loved that you did that. And the other thing that I thought was great, and I'm sure this was all part of the plan. And I wondered if it was part of the plan from the very beginning, or if it kind of came at the end, but when the movie was over and there was, uh, not necessarily the the credit part, but where the information on kind of like reliving what had happened and you went to the actual footage. Um, and when you got to that point where you were showing the, um, the footage from Dallas, that was uh, when Steve talks about, you know, crying, uh, I was like overcome, just overcome mm. by that because of the volume of people that were there. And I don't think I realized how massive, how massive it was. And of course, Mr. Graham speaking, who's now gone, you know, it's like, it was not a part of my childhood, but certainly a part of, you know, a part of my life that I I remember so vividly. Were you always going to put some of that stuff in there, you know, uh, or was that something that came as you were working your way through making the film? Yeah, I mean, Explo seventy two is a big part of um, uh, of kind of the impetus of of this whole movement. I mean, a quarter million people, a lot of them young, 
uh, descended on Dallas. And right. it's just extraordinary. I mean, it really is. I mean, imagine that happening today. I think uh, <laughs> I think people would lose their minds. <laughs> and so on, on both sides of the aisle. And, uh, you know, and so, you know, that was something that we were really intrigued by. You see Expo 72 in, in Woodlawn, which was an earlier film of ours. And and we just decided to bring it back, and uh, because it is so impactful, and it is it is representative of of kind of the wasn't even the culmination of the Jesus movement because it continued throughout yeah. the early to mid seventies, and and um, you know I read a stat whether it's true or not something like twenty million uh, young people were saved throughout that entire uh, eight eight years or so, but. Uh, you know, just just an incredible time period in my in my opinion to be alive and and for us to be able to document it and tell us tell one story of the literally millions of stories that are out there uh, so that people could really get a taste and a flavor uh, of how God moved in a very uh, in a time that was really full of turmoil and um, no different than today. I mean, man, we're coming out of a hundred year pandemic where people are just confused and there's a lot of dysfunction and what is truth and what is not. And, and just a lot of relatability to the time period of today, which I think is why audiences are responding so well. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've had the opportunity to talk to the Irwin several times, and, and since they have this niche carved out of doing dramatic interpretations of real-life events, there's always a moment where, you know, most recently with, uh, uh, or very recently with uh, American Underdog, where you are screening it for the people who are involved originally, the real people of the story, like with the Warners. Did you have any moments like that in showing the final finished film? And what was that like? Yeah, I mean, when we showed it to Kelsey for the first time, I mean, he broke down in tears. Um, you know, he, he uh, you know, he beautiful thing. I mean, he re, literally he relived it uh, on television so people could really uh, kind of be there um, when he saw the film for the first time. But the emotion was very much similar to how he told it, uh, told it on t- TV. But um you know i gosh there's so many stories of, of of you know the audience here's the thing that i love about our cast so much is when you produce a movie you know you're hiring actors right and so they're they are actors are supposed to play people that are not themselves and so um but the goal is is that you have a cast that will really buy into the story that you're wanting to tell and on this movie i was personally wondering okay our title is jesus revolution we're not changing it And um, will this cast really buy in? And they not only bought in from the beginning, but they bought in throughout the entire process, all the way through the post-production process and the promotion process. So nobody apologized for this thing. And they, uh, they actually, you know, they put the movie on their shoulders. And I think people feel that in their performance and they feel that in their promotion when they talk about it. Oh Mm -hmm. man. Mm -hmm. Guys, uh, what a great hour. I'm glad you're with us. Um, you got to see the film. It's called The Jesus Revolution. And uh, if you go, because I suggested you go, you will, after you went, rise up and call me blessed. And Kevin, too. I mean, he had something to do with it, too. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, this is really hard work, and we have to have periods of rest where we take a nap and have cookies and milk. Guys, we're um, we're hanging out with writer, director, producer, actor Kevin Down, who is also fun to be around. Yes, this is. has been a great time. You got to see the movie Jesus Revolution. Uh, it's a it's a life changing movie. Kevin, just one quick follow up question on Kelsey Grammer. Um, uh, was he? just curious was he your first choice to play uh, a chuck and and uh, because you know i mean 
I mean, Frazier was just, and that's not the only thing, obviously, that he ever did, but Frazier was such an iconic character in both of the sitcoms, you know, and everything. It was hard. When I saw that he was going to be play Chuck, I thought, oh, wow, (laughs) this is going to be interesting. But your comment (laughs) before the last break was great. You look for somebody who is not at all the person that you want them to play. So at that point, I thought, well, that makes perfect sense. (laughs) Yeah, so... um in the in the iteration of the film that everybody has seen, uh, uh, Kelsey was our first choice and only choice, and and so John Irwin and I we sat down and and I'm like, okay, who do you want to play Chuck? And he goes, I just really think Kelsey Grammer. And at first, I'm like, huh, um, I wasn't sure he'd do it. That was kind of my, you know, mm-hmm. producers are supposed to be negative, so my take was, I don't know if he'll do it, but let's just reach out and give it a shot. What we didn't know is that Kelsey, the first day on set, so you know, we 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 kind of worked with his people and whatnot, and he agreed to do it. But the first day on set, I asked Kelsey, I'm like, why'd you do this? Like, why did you say yes to this? I don't understand. And he was very sincere and um <laughs> immediately it threw me because I was expecting him to talk like Fraser Crane. Right. And <laughs> yeah. And uh and so I was like, and he's a very thoughtful man and he's very gentle and he's very humble. And I was like, man, like you, it's the type of guy you just want to hang out with. And, uh, and he goes, you know, Kevin, I, I, a couple of months ago, I was hanging out with some friends of mine and we were just trying, we were just kind of talking about our career and all the things that we've done. And, you know, for me, I've made people laugh and I've done some significant roles, but all of us were kind of uh pointing to the fact we'd love to do something that really makes an impact on generations uh beyond our lifetime and so wow. the next morning i wake up and your script is in my email inbox mm. and i couldn't mm. believe it and so i read it and immediately i was so in love with it i emailed my reps and i said you got to put me in this movie just make it happen and we didn't know that like we had no idea and so you know, it was it was such an easy process for him to say yes. And that was why I was curious. I'm like, well, I don't understand what's driving you. And uh, and that was what it was. He just felt like in his spirit, this was something that he had to do. And I, and I know he's so thrilled that he did it because it's just he's he has been to a number of our pre-release screenings and he's just so proud of it. And obviously he promoted it um, from the heart. And uh, and lo- I was, I love him. I mean, I have such respect for him, and he's such a wonderful human being. And it was glad to get to work with him. Mm-hmm. Great. Yeah. Uh, Kevin, uh, I, you know, we've we've been talking along like everybody knows the story, but I don't know if we've given just the quick overview of the whole story. Can you give just a one minute summary of kind of what the movie covers in terms of yeah, that period I mean, of history? Know, it fol- yeah, it follows a number of characters, and so we. Our goal was was to have uh, leads that are younger as well as leads lead actors that are older so that we have entry points from multiple generations. And so, uh, you know, we're following a young Greg Laurie who ends up turning into a, you know, a a preacher at a megachurch in California. But we're, we're following him through the early 70s and he's in high school and just kind of his struggle to search for truth in all the wrong places and uh, he meets uh, a you know a young woman by the name of Kathy, and, and there's a love story there, which I think has really uh, drawn a lot of young younger people in, just to kind of follow their love story in a different time period. Um, and then we meet Chuck Smith, who's an uh, an elder gentleman, a uh, pastor in a church that is uh, failing and doesn't have a large audience, and he's just kind of wondering what to do and sort of lamenting, like, you know, with his wife, like, I want to do something that really reaches people for the gospel, but I don't know how to get it there. And then along comes this hippie street p- preacher from Southern Cal or from Northern California named Lonnie Frisbee. And uh, the two of them just hit it off. I mean, they're complete opposites in their approach. But the thing that drives them together is their commonality and their faith in Jesus Christ. And you can see it on screen in the relationship that Kelsey and Jonathan have with one another. And that's how it was with uh, Chuck Smith and, and, um, and Lonnie in real life. I mean, there was just a genuine uh, ability to be able to draw people to want to hear them preach and to want to hear them talk about their love for Jesus in a way that was so um, uh, magnetic. Mm -hmm. 
Kevin, I, and this is not a political statement, but unless you've got your head in the sand, we live in a culture. You mentioned uh, they were looking for meaning in the wrong places. There are elements of our culture who would say that what you say about wrong places are not wrong places, whose worldview is totally different than yours, and who get angry at people who have a worldview different than theirs. And they're not gonna they're not gonna be happy with this movie because it's gonna be very successful. Uh, and you're gonna be criticized. Does that bother you? Do you Oh care? not at all. I mean my my response to them is um if 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 they think that uh uh, taking illegal drugs is their version of the truth, and God bless you. And um, <laughs> but because that that's that's what we show in the film, right? So I mean, obviously, there's a lot of different variations of that, but in the film, that was what we showed because that was very prevalent in that time period. Um, just just a lot of uh, you know freewheeling and drugs and whatnot. And so um, you know, uh, for us, we were telling a true story based on actual events, and a lot of the script was taken from interviews from Greg and Kathy. Obviously, they had a book that was out that we adapted. Um, you know, and, and there's just so much out there on on Lonnie and 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 uh, and Chuck and 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 some of these people. So uh, we love it. I mean, we're excited about the story that was told, and and the, the hope of our movies again is just to be able to uplift the human spirit. Um, so we're not trying to be divisive in any way. We really are trying to encourage people. And so the themes of love and unity and hope, which are so transparent in this movie, um, which you will see once you watch the other three quarters of it, <laughs> I promise you. And so uh, uh, I, that, that's what I'm that's what I'm excited about, because people are really seeing that they're getting it. They want to, which is why they're going back to the theater three, four five times already and uh is that they want to have that feeling that rush of hope and they want to take that away and uh, implement it into their everyday life oh man kevin i started to say i know how busy you are and how valuable that you but you're on vacation <laughs> it's even more valuable <laughs> so it kind of yeah it really is as a matter of fact you are a delight and uh, we've enjoyed this hour with it with you and hope we can do it again sometime god bless you man what you're doing is so very important. Don't you shilly shally. Uh, no, I appreciate it. I, look, I want to encourage people, go and take your friends and relatives to the theater while this movie is in the theater because the pictures of people gathering and praying for everybody uh, in the theater is something that you want to be a part of. Hey, yep. guys, we'll be back in a little bit. Don't go anywhere. Kevin really is a lot of fun to hang out with. And man, has he done something that is powerful. Uh, interesting that he said that they didn't plan it, but the thing at Asbury and other Christian colleges and universities that we see happening right now, and this film together is a powerful wallop uh, on our culture and maybe the match that lights the gasoline of another great awakening like the one that is portrayed in this movie. You know, God's ways are circuitous, and generally whatever you think he's doing, he probably isn't. And that's why it's dangerous to act like you've got God in your back pocket, and that if you do certain things, he'll bring an awakening, and if you're pure and good and faithful, then he'll do what you want. That's, not, that's a lie. God does as he pleases, and he does it right well. But I do pray, and so do a lot of other people, and I hear it all over the country, people who are praying for God to do it again. And uh, there is the smell that maybe that's exactly what's happening at Asbury and in some other places. And uh, 
I, you know, I'm cramming for finals. So I've often said to him, you know, before I have to go home, could we have a party? <laughs> I mean, just one more, one big party, because that was fun. And I get a sense that that may be happening and that this film may be a real part of that. So, so don't miss it. Get all, as Kevin said, get your friends and relatives and especially your friends who are not unbelievers and if, who are not believers. And if you don't have any friends that are not believers, you're just a lump of leaven. <laughs> I mean, you don't do any bread any good. So go find a pagan, make a friend, and then bring them to this movie. You'll be glad you did, and they will too. Kathy, who's going to be on next time? One of our new friends, we've had him on several times recently, Michael Reeves, has a new book on book out, and it's a fairly small little book, but it's Evangelical Pharisees, The Gospel as Cure for the Church's Hypocrisy. That ought to be fun. That'll be a, Oh, no, I love that. <laughs> Uh, being an expert in hypocrisy. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you've got the kind of job, I, you know, sometimes you smile when you don't want to. And you look religious when you're an atheist. And you say prayers when you don't mean them. And you preach when you would rather be somewhere else. So you're saying this is right up your yeah, alley. I'm <laughs> going to probably end up convicted. <laughs> and if you want to see all of us convicted, show up next time, same place. And between now and then, don't do anything we wouldn't. And that gives you a wide, <laughs> wide berth. Okay, I have started a movement. Nice. <laughs> Can't have a legend. Now, there isn't another script in no. this. <laughs> you may feel free to throw this in. Kathy, I found your script in the car. You did? You did? <laughs> <laughs> no, I waited till we got done with our last show. And-